Hello, welcome back. We're going to be reading ghost stories and having a lesson on pages 139 to 164. Um, I'd like to start off today's lesson by saying thank you to everyone um, in my fourth mod class who was there to um, witness uh, the story of all of us being honored with uh, the Teacher of the Year Award. I know that I'm the Teacher of the Year, but the reason I am is because of all of you. So here is the plaque. If you weren't in fourth mod, you didn't get to see it, so here it is. And I'll bring it into school next week so people can see it. I now have a big responsibility to represent all the teachers in the state of Vermont and most importantly, all of you and your families um, at the state level. So I'm excited for that, and we can talk more about that in school next week. For now, we're going to continue our work. Where we left off was in the courthouse where the judge had to decide whether or not uh, the use of excessive force, manslaughter, or murder was going to be uh, happening to Officer Moore. And what was decided was that in the opinion of this court, there is not enough evidence to charge Officer Moore with excessive force, manslaughter, or murder. That was on page um, 138, right at the bottom. So that was very disappointing, I think, for all of us, and especially for Jerome and for his family, um, that Officer Moore doesn't seem to be getting held responsible for um, killing Jerome in the park uh, that uh, day after school. So now we're going to pick up the story at chapter um, that is titled School and After, and then we'll read a chapter called uh, tell no lies and then a chapter called listening and then the next chapter is called schools out so I'm going to begin I'm reading on page 139 school and after it's May dandelions are white now puffs of seeds float reseeding the grass and vacant lots school will be over in six weeks every morning Carlos meets Kim. He says hola to Grandma and grips Kim's heavy backpack. Thanks, Kim answers, a little breathless. I follow behind them, but today I panic. Mike, Eddie, and Snap are at the top of the stairs, standing century-like in front of the school doors. Other kids don't ask them to move. They just swarm, flow around them. I'm scared. Mike, Eddie, and Snap never bullied Kim, but maybe that's changed now. I howl, no reaction. I can't protect Kim. Grandma, worried, shouts, Kim, sensing danger. It's okay, Carlos shouts back. And Grandma sways side to side, her arms crossed over her stomach. Carlos holds Kim's hand, rail thin. He isn't much taller than Kim. He's not much of a match for one bully, let alone three. Wary, Kim watches Carlos. I do, too, worrying Carlos is going to pull another toy gun. Even a toy gun brings cops, endangers Kim. I keep circling. Kim, Snap, Eddie, Mike, Carlos, wishing I could be visible, alive again. Keep my little sister safe. I feet planted strong, Carlos says, Kim es mi familia. Fiercely, he repeats, ella es mi familia. Eddie steps one step down, face to face with Carlos, closer to Carlos and Kim. I scream, no one hears. 
Eddie offers his hand. Bueno, con respeto, he says, loud enough for everyone to hear. Some kids stop, peer. Others keep walking, their heads down. Con respeto. Carlos smiles. Eddie turns to Kim. I'm sorry about your brother. I worry Kim's going to call him a bully. But she's smart. Eddie can still make life hurt for her and Carlos. She simply says, thanks. Relieved, everyone smiles. Carlos and Kim wave at Grandma. Eddie, Mike, and Snap walk close behind them. Kids stare. All four, Carlos, Eddie, Mike, and Snap, walk my sister to class. Not quite a new alliance, just a truce. I sit on the school steps and cry. Not unhappily, but happy. How come life seems better now that I'm dead? Not even the bullies are bullies anymore. While I still ache for Ma and Pop, Grandma and Kim are moving on. Carlos helps. Life is better. When will I get to move on? When will Emmett, the other ghost boys? I stand yelling. No one hears, sees me. I yell and yell. Not fair. The school bell rings. So that's the end of that chapter. And the characters that we've just been uh, reading about are Kim, Carlos, Eddie, Snap, and Mike. And the theme in this chapter is power and responsibility. What happens in this chapter is Carlos is bringing Kim to school. That always used to be Jerome's job. And Grandma follows to make sure everything's okay. And... It turns out that Carlos has become even more brave than he was the first day of school. And he screams in Spanish to uh, Eddie, Mike, and Snap that Kim is his family. And that's what I was saying in Spanish. Esta mi familia. That means she's my family. And he's taking a lot of responsibility for Kim. And in this chapter, power is a theme. The power is shifting. Carlos now has power and Eddie, Mike, and Snap are going to use their power and they've sort of formed a truce with Kim and Carlos that they're to be respected and no one is going to be bothering Kim at school. The quote I would take from this chapter would be con respeto um, and that was said by Eddie. The next chapter is called Tell No Lies, and it's on page 145. Sitting on my family's apartment steps, everybody's talking. I never realized folks talked so much. Little kids, old people, the men standing, rapping, gabbing on the corner. When folks are telling stories, the neighborhood is warm. It's like it glows inside. The street smell of barbecue and greens. Everybody's got a story. Did I tell you? Did I tell you about my bad hip? My boss. My boy's moves. Growing up in Carolina. Did I tell you? I got an A in math. About my car getting jacked. Finding a dead baby bird. Did I tell you? Why I cried. How I got hurt. How I howled. Found my lost dog. How's my daddy got sick? How blue crayons are happy. Orange crayons sad. Me, how I died. Kim's right. Carlos has to tell Grandma his story. She can't tell it. Carlos has to tell how he gave me the toy gun. Just like Emmett has to tell me his story but he says I'm not ready to hear it. 
Is that why I'm here? To get ready? Ghost boys haunt. One by one they appear. Several boys wearing hoodies. Sports t-shirts. Overalls. There's a kid who looks like he's eight. Another kid, Tamir, with a toy gun. Ghosts fill the street. Some stand in front or beside or behind the living. Two worlds. Grandma is right. Dead, living, both worlds are close. Every goodbye ain't gone. Even though life ends, it also doesn't end. Mr. Anders, Beagle, Joey, barks. Shh, hisses Mr. Anders. Joey sniffs. I think, good boy, good dog. It's a half moon. Emmett appears. All the ghosts watch him. He, was he the first black boy to be killed? Nah, I don't believe that. Slavery was awful. Afterwards, Pop said the KKK began lynching. Ghost boys nod, step back, high five. Emmett's the leader, the leader of our crew. An unnatural alliance, young but dead, ghost boys. I understand now, everything isn't all about me. So this is huge, and that's where we hear the title of the story, Ghost Boys. It just gets said like that. And in Tell No Lies, we hear about um, needing to tell stories. The people in the neighborhood telling their stories. Everyone feels like they need to be heard and tell their story. And Jerome really wants to know Emmett's story. But he's told him you're not ready. And um, this chapter is really uh, what the theme of it is, is called coming of age. That might sound weird, but it's a typical name of a theme. And it's when somebody who is young becomes more mature. They become more like an adult. And right now, Jerome is having a thought that's not like a little kid who just wants to think about themselves and is only feeling sorry for himself. Why did I get killed? Now Jerome realizes, here's the quote, I understand now everything isn't all about me. Uh, Jerome says that right at the very end of the chapter. Um, so now we're going to move on. We're going to move to the chapter. It's titled Listening. It is on page 149. Listening. What happened to you? What went down? Me and Emmett are alone. Ghost boys have disappeared like they know it's time for Emmett's tale. Neighbors are asleep. The moon shines. Moths flit. It's garbage day tomorrow. Rats dig inside pails, eat through plastic bags, my neighborhood's poor, segregated. Until I started wandering, I didn't know by how much. I didn't know how much I was living in danger zone. But why did cops fear me? Are you ready to hear? I nod. Emmett sighs. Let's go to my home. Remember, um... Emmett Till is also from Chicago, and he's about to take uh, Jerome to his home in Chicago. Two shakes and we're there. A two-story brick house with squat deep steps and an awning to keep rain off the landing. Westwood Lawn. My mother and I lived on the top floor. His apartment isn't far from where my family lives. Has our neighborhood always been poor? Emmett speaks slowly. My great-uncle Moses Wright and his wife Elizabeth lived in Money, Mississippi. My cousins Curtis, Wheeler, and I begged to visit them. We wanted to play with Simon, Robert, and Maurice, six boys. Almost enough to field a team. 
Plus Maurice said he'd take us fishing. Four rivers passed near his home, and there were seven deep lakes. Can you imagine? I wanted to see all that water. My uncle was a sharecropper, but he lived in the nicest tenant house on Frederick Plantation. It was a run-down shack with a tin roof, but it had two bedrooms in the front and two in the back. Me and my cousin slept in blue metal beds and shared boxes for our clothes. Happy. We didn't mind. Dirt poor people, Mother used to say. That's why I left Mississippi, because I didn't want to be a sharecropper picking cotton. Dirt poor, Emmett repeats. A stinky outhouse, an ice box with real ice, not electricity to cool food. But I loved being in Mississippi with my cousins. They roamed. In Chicago, Mother never let me roam. Emmett's head falls back. I think he's looking at the sky, but he isn't. His eyes are closed. A shudder shakes him. He looks at the ground, then back at me. His eyes widening pools. Pull me in like I'm going to drown. After an overnight train ride, I arrive in Money, Mississippi, August 24th, 21st. August 28th, I died. I'm not on the outside anymore. I'm inside in an old-time black-and-white movie. Emmett's telling his story by making me feel. Standing on the roadside, I watch Emmett alive again, living in his old world. Oak trees arch, cypress leaves hang, grass is knee high, crows soar and screech, woodpeckers peck, squirrels scamper. Emmett and his cousins play. The air is hot, hotter than Chicago's. And though I can't feel it, I can see wet in the air. Sweat soaks everybody. Emmett wears his rimmed hat. He still looks like a chipmunk, but now with skin, plump and fresh. Emmett's laughing, his shoulders brushing against Maurice's. He likes Maurice best. He's the oldest, the big brother. They wrestle, half serious. Come on, Simon shouts. Everybody runs, kicking up dust, stumbling over rocks, running through the forest. The cousins run to the river. Emmett's hat falls. I try to shout, Emmett, your hat. Wheeler points at Simon. He's the youngest, littlest. Emmett nods. Then him and Wheeler lift Simon, dumping him into the river. It's so hot, Simon doesn't mind. Robert and Maurice laugh. Let's go to town. Maurice pivots back towards Emmett. Resting his hand on his shoulder, he says, quite serious, say, yes, ma'am, no, sir, to white people. Don't look anybody in their eyes. Emmett throws a stone. It skips across the water, sinks. You're not my uncle, my mother either. Don't be stupid, Emmett. This is Mississippi. I know it's Mississippi. Sidestep if white people are walking on the same street. Step into the road if you have to. Let whites pass first. Emmett wipes sweat from his forehead, muttering, not afraid of white people. But no one hears me. Town isn't much. Dirt roads, wood sidewalks. A few stores with porches, segregated. Black and white men play checkers and drink soda outside. Countrymen in denim, women in flowery dresses, two black girls skip. The day is sunshiny and bright. The biggest store is Bryant's Grocery and Meat Market. Maury says the Bryant's sell mostly to blacks. White folks drive to Greenwood. They've got much better stores. Bryant's have bubblegum, asks Emmett. Be careful. Don't say anything, pipes Simon. 
his clothes still wet. Scornful, Emmett boasts. Life is different in Chicago. I talk with white people all the time. No, you don't, scowls Simon. I do. I'll show you. He heads toward the store. Don't, says Simon. Think I'm scared? Simon grips Emmett's shoulder. Emmett shrugs him off. Don't. My voice makes no sound. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Emmett, don't be stupid. Here's different, says Simon, fierce, desperate. Tell him, Maurice. Folks don't care about black people. Don't like black people. Don't even believe we're people, says Maurice, sorrowful. Emmett doesn't listen. He walks into the store. Not much of a store. Some chips, penny candy, cold sodas, bag of flour, sugar, salt. A woman with long brown hair sits on a stool behind the counter. She's pale with red lipstick and brown eyes. Emmett digs out a purple bubble gum from a bin and puts a penny in her hand. He walks away, not seeing the woman's outrage. I see it. Hatred. At the doorway, he stops, turns, and smiles. Goodbye. Wordless, I holler. Run, Emmett. Like I tried to run. Simon leaps onto the porch. You spoke to her? Yeah, Emmett unwraps his gum. Said goodbye like I would in Chicago. Put the penny in her hand. Put the penny in her hand. So? Simon hops, twists, like the ground is on fire. He drags Emmett toward the cousins. He speaks rapidly, squeaking. Talked, touched her. Robert trembles. Wheeler asks, what's wrong? Curtis, like Emmett, is dumbfounded. We've got to go, insists Maurice. What? What? Why? What? What's? What's wrong? Emmett stutters. Mrs. Bryant bolts out of the store. Her yellow dress flaps. She's fetching her pistol. Warns Simon. Stunned, Emmett can't move. No one can. They're paralyzed. Mrs. Bryant flings open her car door. Reaches inside. What? 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 What's wrong? Anxious, his voice pitches high. W -w what's w -w wrong? W sounds whistle. The white lady glares at Emmett like he's a monster. She thinks he's mocking her, whistling at her. A crowd gathers. White men, women, even some kids. Black people, heads lowered, step, side away disappearing, escaping, even dead. I can feel, smell the danger. Run, screams Maurice. Run, echoes Simon. Emmett runs, runs as fast as he can. He can't run fast enough. Emmett pauses, closes his eyes, then mutters. I begged my cousin not to tell my uncle and aunt. I don't want to be sent back to Chicago, I said. I was young, embarrassed. I didn't understand the trouble I was in. But you didn't do anything wrong. Emmett almost fades. Then I see the shape of him, more focused and bold. What mattered was what they, white people, thought I had done. It gets worse. See? I stare into his eyes. Past midnight, the house is cloaked in darkness. Two white men burst into the shack, guns pulled, flashlights startling, searching faces. Everyone's howling, frightened. Aunt Elizabeth runs toward the back bedroom. They follow her. Emmett's face is caught in the flashlight's glow. Get up, get dressed, petrified, Emmett wets himself. He pulls his overalls over his pajamas. He's a child, not from here, his uncle pleads, begs. 
He didn't know. A man with black curls and a short-sleeved white shirt slams him against the wall. How old are you? 64. You make any trouble and you'll never live to be 65. Simon grabs hold of Emmett's leg, trying to keep the men from dragging him away. The second man kicks him. Simon wails, clutches his stomach. Mr. Wheeler holds his brother. Emmett screams, Mama! Mama! His uncle and cousins are shouting, begging, pleading on the porch. Emmett's pushed into a truck's cab. He's caught between two men. One drives, one just keeps punching Emmett. Teach you! I'm going to teach you! Bam! You talk sass? Bam! Nobody disrespects my wife. Bam! Bam! Emmett's face swells. I don't want to see this. I pull back. How many times has Emmett shared this tale? Hundreds? Thousands? I inhale deep. Staring into his eyes, I'm inside again. The film rolls. The Tallahatchie River glows silver. Lightning bugs blink. Fish splash, leaping for moths, flies. Emmett is dragged from the truck. Mama! Mother isn't going to help you, boy. His fist falls like a hammer. Emmett drops to his knees. The dark-haired man grabs his leg, pulls. You whistled at my wife. He chokes Emmett. Emmett squirming, trying to beat the hands away. His feet lift off the ground. Who do you think you are? Eyes bulge. Blood float flows his mouth. He's thrown to the ground. I can't look. I can't help but look. A gun. Emmett isn't moving. Seeing his body on the ground... I see myself. The husband fires the gun. Sparks fly. Emmett's spirit rises. With barbed wire, the men lash Emmett's body to a large wheel. They drag, shove the wheel into the water. Watch it sink. Blood stains the riverbank. Emmett's hat rests. Amazingly, it's clean. Off to the side, brim up. I'm sorry, Emmett, really sorry. Ghost boys appear, hovering, studying Emmett's face and mine. For all of us, says Emmett, waving his hand outward, we're all sorry. We're all sorry for each other. Somebody's decided they didn't like us, that we were a threat, a danger, a menace. The ghost boys nod, waiting for something, waiting on me. I feel it. The ghost boys are my new family. Then I feel an urge deep inside me, a recognition, injustice, tragedy. My mouth opens. A sound I didn't know I could make keens out of me, terrifying, mournful. Only the dead hear it. My wail rises and falls, rises and falls. Emmett's spirit blends with mine. Merging, we cry, not fair. I died too young, too soon. Ghost boys scream. Holler, echo, not fair, died too young, too soon. We exhaust ourselves. The real world sleeps. Maybe somewhere someone sings Amazing Grace. Is Kim dreaming? Is Grandma muttering in her sleep? What about my parents? All the parents of murdered boys. Do they rest quiet? Did Emmett's mom ever rest? 
Is she dead now? One by one, two by two, in small clusters, my ghost crew roams. Emmett murmurs, bear witness. What's that mean? Everyone needs their story heard, felt. We honor each other, connect across time. Dumbstruck, I watch Emmett wander, zigzag down the middle of the street. I wait and wait and wait until the sun rises, until the neighborhood stirs. I feel like I'm a hundred years old. I feel like I've just woken up. So that chapter was listening. It's titled Listening because Jerome is bearing witness by listening to Emmett Till tell his story about how he was murdered in Mississippi by angry white men who believed that Emmett had disrespected one of their wives. Um, the theme in this story is injustice, the injustice of Emmett and Jerome and all the other black boys who died too young and they joined together in sorrow for each other. Bearing witness means to listen to someone's story. And this is what Emmett says. Everyone needs their story heard, felt. We honor each other. When you're looking at this chapter, the part of the chapter that's in italics, the fancy cursive writing, that's when the story is back in time and it's what happened to Emmett Till. The other parts of the story are when the ghost boys are together or Jerome is talking or asking Emmett a question. The last chapter is called Schools Out, and the character in this chapter is Jerome. Schools Out is on page 163. Schools Out. Winter, spring, summer. Every time I see a black kid, I yell, be safe. They never hear me. Walking my neighborhood, I wonder how anyone can laugh, be happy. The streets are dangerous. Gangs, bullies, drive-bys, police with guns. But people need to be happy or else be like me. I shout, dead, listless, weighed down with hard stories. Strange, though, I feel something's in the air, like a shift, something I've got to do. Lately, I've been lingering on my street. Nights, wild sunflowers in the vacant lot close up. Scents of chicken and collards blow through the kitchen windows. I wish I could eat, play, hug my sister, pat a dog, stroke a cat. Without rest, I wander and watch, see a world that's no longer mine. Carlos was trying to make me happy, and I was happy for a bit. If I'd known I was going to die, would I have become his friend? Truth is, even though it didn't last long, it was nice to have a friend. That was a very short chapter called Schools Out. So he's been dead quite a while, Jerome. And this chapter is him thinking about the short friendship that he had with Carlos. And he says, truth is, even though it didn't last long, it was nice to have a friend. And isn't that the truth? That's one of the most important things, I think, in our lives are our friends, our family and our friends. Most people will say that, right? And for a short time, Jerome got to be friends with Carlos. 
and Carlos is taking up the responsibility to continue to be Jerome's friend and really to bear witness to his story. Um, that seems to be Carlos's role in the story. So um, let's take a look at some of the questions here. Um, why do you think Eddie, Mike, and Snap have stopped bullying Carlos and now respect him? That was in the in the first chapter where he says con respeto. I think that's because Eddie, Mike, and Snap are shocked, just like everyone else, about what happened to Jerome, and it is bringing people together. Many times when tragedy happens, people come together in an understanding. People who were enemies become friends. Um, and the second question is, why does Jerome want to move on and not be a ghost boy anymore? What is stopping him? Well, Jerome just doesn't understand what's going on, and he doesn't want to be in pain anymore. That's why uh, he wants to move on. Uh, but what's stopping him is that he needs to bear witness to Emmett Till's story. He needs to hear Emmett Till and understand. That's in this chapter here, the coming of age chapter. He finally realizes that I understand now. Everything isn't all about me. And why does Kim stop dancing and feeling happy and tells Carlos he's going to have to tell Grandma about the toy gun. Well, Kim stops dancing and feeling happy and tells Carlos he's going to have to tell Grandma about the gun because that is his responsibility, is to uh, come up to the Grandma and let her know that he was the one that gave uh, Carlos the gun he feels uh, gave Jerome the gun he feels very responsible for Jerome's death and he needs to get that off of his chest um, and why do you think that Jerome realizes that everything isn't about him what do you think it's about well I'm going to leave that for you to decide um, and why does Emmett Till finally tell Jerome his story I think Emmett after this part realizes that Jerome has grown up a little bit, he's come of age and he knows that he's ready now to hear, to hear what has happened. So that's it for today. Good luck answering your questions. Rewatch the video if you need to, and I will see you in school next week.